cycling, like any other sport, can become extremely competitive. And when cycling becomes competitive, choosing the right bicycle can spell the difference between winning and losing. In the 2019th edition of the Tour de France, for example, the winner cyclist had a bicycle made by a manufacturer called Pinarillo. While that detail may seem inconsequential at first, when you factor in how seven out of the last 10 Tour de France races were won by bicycles made by the same manufacturer, it suddenly becomes much more important. With that kind of track record, it's safe to say that Pinarello knows their stuff when it comes to making winning bikes. But this story is not all about winning. Rather, it's more about the opposite of it. Our story begins in 1922, when Giovanni Pinarello, or Nanni to his friends, was born, the eighth of 12 children in a small village of Catinia di Villorba in the north of Italy. The Pinarillo family was one that lived a humble rural life where daily living was a struggle, worsened by the challenges brought on by the First World War. Such difficulties throughout his childhood greatly affected Nanni, but little did he know how much his life would change in his teens. At just 15, Nanni was hired at the factory of Paglianti, where he helped manufacture bicycles and during his spare time he borrowed whatever he could just to ride a bike. His dream was simple, to become a professional cyclist. It wouldn't be long before he realised how complicated the journey would be for someone like him. But no struggles, wars or lack of money would ever succeed to extinguish his burning love for bicycles. At 17, Nanni began officially chasing his dream by entering and competing in the junior category of cycling races. He was skilled and passionate, and this showed in the growing number of trophies crowding his shelf. His dream was actually becoming reality. By the time he was 24, Nanni had ended up accumulating over 60 trophies to his name. At this point, he was a pro. However, with success, came much higher stakes. Now he had sponsors to impress and he was able to do so with a few wins here and there, but the biggest challenge was yet to come. The Giro d'Italia, one of the most prestigious bike races in the world. Now, it's worth mentioning that during a few editions of the Giro d'Italia, in addition to the pink jersey given to the winner, the race organizers also handed out a black jersey to the last place. When most people would think no one would ever want to be given such a prize, notably two cyclists, Malabrocco and Carollo, made the black jersey their main source of rivalry, hiding behind bushes, in bars or even puncturing their own wheels just to waste as much time as possible. The ability consisted in crossing the finish line just within the time limit of the race while still arriving last. This was fun and all, but the black jersey wasn't always a light joke, and it happened that cyclists won it without purposely trying to arrive last. For example, in 1948, the honour was awarded to Aldo Bini, who stubbornly continued to race despite breaking a hand earlier in a fall. So while for some of the races of the Giro d'Italia, the black jersey was jokingly sought after as a light-hearted reward, in other editions, the prize was treated much more seriously. But let's get back to the race. It was the 1951's edition of the Giro d'Italia, and every great champion was there. The world was watching. This was Nanni's chance to truly prove his worth as a cyclist by riding against legends. This was his chance to be one of them. The race had its cyclists riding more than 4,000 kilometers and going through more than 20 stages before it came to an end. And Giovanni? He did not win. Nor was he second either. In fact, he didn't even make it on the podium. His place? 75th. Out of the 75 riders, that crossed the finish line. For Nanni, winning the black jersey wasn't a joke. It meant losing his place in the team and being replaced to make way for an up-and-coming star, Pasqualino Fornara. Nanni didn't have a say. 
His sponsor offered him 100,000 lira, and Nanni heavily heartedly accepted it and stepped down. This was a major disappointment that could have easily crushed his dreams of making a difference in the world of cycling. I say could have, because instead of giving up, Nanni chose to hold on to his passion, focusing instead on designing and manufacturing his own cycles. Using the liquidation from his team and the skills he gained during his early career, Nanni opened up his own workshop in Catena di Villorba. This is the beginning of Cicli Pinarello. The new venture would give Nanni new stresses, ideas, struggles, but ultimately also delight. In 1961, Cicli Pinarello earned its first win at the Tour de l'Avenir. A strong sign that Nanni was definitely on the right track once more, though there was still a lot of work to be done. Undeterred, Nanni pressed on. Win after win, the manufacturer gained traction as a popular top-of-the-class cycling brand amongst professionals and amateurs alike until it became the winning machine we know of today. So yes, it can be depressing to chase your dream, only for it to be crushed right before your eyes. But there are two very different ways of reacting to that situation. The first one is the easiest, to give up. You can say that you tried, that you were passionate about it, that you gave your best, but in the end, reality won and you just couldn't make it. It's time to move on to something else. The second is what Nanny did, and definitely the much harder one to do, to find the opportunity within the failure. As they say, every cloud has its silver lining and some moments just need you to look harder to find them. Shifting your vision doesn't always mean giving up on your dream. In fact, sometimes it's what you need to do to make it come true. As Cicli Pinarello proves, it is from the worst failures that we can expect the best opportunities.